and I'm walking back from a tennis game, and there's a little church off to the side, and it has a little reader on it, and uh, the prettiest girl in town is walking in, and she smiled at me. I followed her right in that church. I'm in a white shirt with blue piping, white tennis shorts, white socks, white shoe, white tennis shoes, and a red, white, and blue tennis racket over my shoulder. I sat there and I listened, and it was exciting. It made sense to me the way they were saying it. And the minister uh, got up after the uh, uh, last song, and she said, and I want to tell you, in two weeks, we're starting a ministerial school. Monday morning, before noon, I was signed up for ministerial school in the science of mind, religious science, philosophy. Two years of self-introspection, self-workshops oh, that it brought you right to your core of your being and um, seeing people change and watching them change and not realizing how much I had probably changed. And then, boom, we graduate. We're out, you know, no more looking at auras, no more um, digging deep into your heart of hearts and finding uh, a little forgiveness that you hadn't pushed out or forgiven yourself for, or forgiven somebody else for. And my really good friend, Christian, and I found that Newport Beach didn't have a church of religious science. Two weeks later, there was a church of religious science. We got a charter. We started a church. Um, it was in one of the big centers. And um, for six months, we ran that church together, and we found a church building that um, had not been used for a couple of years, and we made a deal to rent, it, rent the church building, and um, the church started to grow. We had, I don't know, maybe 150 people on the, on the register and 75 people coming on Sunday, and it was glorious until somebody bought the church. They didn't offer it to us. And I think it was the LDS. <laughs> anyway, I decided I would retire and go back into business. And, and I did. And now I just give talks uh, on Sundays or any <laughs> anytime I uh, get a chance to give a talk. And isn't the internet challenging opportunist, um, opening your mind and your soul to uh, different ideas and thoughts. And, <clears throat> and yet, isn't it confusing sometimes? And I wanted to talk about change because change is the thing that is probably driving us apart rather than bringing us together. There are people that sedentary, set in their ways, and they're not wanting to change. And there are other people like, I see some faces out here, embrace change. Hey, where's the newest thing? What's the, going to happen? Who am I going to uh, listen to today? What am I going to learn today? What is the most interesting thing you've learned all week? You know, run your mind back. What is the most interesting thing? It's like the man, <clears throat> excuse me, coming into the room and he sees a candle and he lights that candle and he can see a little 10 by 10 square room and there's an easy chair and he sits down and, and he rocks back a little bit. And oh, as he rocks back, there's a, there's a switch. What do you do? You're going to turn on that switch, aren't you? He turns it on and it's a hundred foot room. The lights have gone on. Over there in the corner, right there by Dylan, there's some movement. What do you do? Do you sit back and rock in your easy chair, or do you niggle over there and find out what's going on? 
Well, they say I'm related to Kit Carson, and Kit Carson used to bring um, people from Virginia to the coast of California and Oregon and Washington. He was a an explorer, a, a, a leader of uh, change, and anyway, so I'm I'm over there finding out who these people are because I know my golden soul and their golden souls are the same. And there's probably something that they can learn from me and I can learn from them. So I'm over there meeting people and talking to people. And I used to go to the grocery store with my dad and I would grumble, 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 grumble. And he never met a, a friend that he didn't like. He never uh, went to the grocery store that he didn't see somebody he knew, or if he didn't know him, he would know him by the end of the grocery store trip. Grumble, 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 grumble. And now what do I do? I talk to everybody in the grocery store. Anyway, okay, so I <clears throat> was looking at change and the internet um, confused me a little bit. I wanted to look at the cellular change in the body, okay? And because I know your cells are uh, dying and replacing and, and, and it's, a, a, it's a big uh, system that works extremely well. And I, I was thinking about, uh, I practiced the talk, and I was thinking about there's enough love in this room to heal any challenge, any dis dash ease or ill dash mess. You notice I always put a dash in there, ill dash mess or dis dash ease. There's enough love in this room to bring us all together and uplift our lives. Anyway, so I looked at the cellular changes and I got two numbers. 37.2 trillion or University of Florida, and I went to school in Florida, said 100 trillion uh, uh, cell changes. I mean, cells in our body and the cell changes were about, <clears throat> it, with the red blood cells were about uh, 2,000 per second. And uh, there's uh, some 200 different types of cells in our body. And this just confused me terribly, you know, from 37.2 to 100. So I didn't know what to do with that. And um, knowing that, that there are a lot of changes. So if we take <clears throat> five and a half seconds of changes of our uh, red blood cells, so if I go 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and a half thousand, that gives us 11,000 cell changes that have been made in that period of time. Now that is exciting, <laughs> interesting, a little scary when you think about it, that your body is, is uh, dying that quickly, but most of those are replaced. So it's not a bad thing. And so that was the very small changes that, that I, I looked at. And then I wanted to look at some big changes. And that confused me also. Because let's say the biggest thing in our solar system is the sun, right? And so stars are monstrously big. And a lot of them are much, much bigger than our sun. <clears throat> so I looked at the changes that happen in that kind of a system, that huge uh, number of system. And, um, you know, it's like one in a million changes. Uh, one every 10,000 years go out of, completely out of existence. But there are billions of dark stars that have no light anymore that are uh, existing. And then, we have just learned that there may not be a big bang. Did you hear that? There may not be a big bang because there are galaxies that have been around, we think, maybe forever. So maybe our big bang is just a clear poof. <laughs> and we're going to have to change. We're going to have to change our thinking because without a big bang, nothing got really, really small and then got really, really big. 
Maybe it was big all the time. Maybe just in that part of the uh, galaxy, we had a, 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 a coming together and then a big bang or clear poof. And I thought, wow, science is going to really be stretched. You know, our millions, hopefully even maybe a billion scientists are going to jump on this and start working on another theory that would replace Big Bang. And then I thought, well, if Stephen Hawking can write a brief history of uh, time, why can't we write our own brief history of science? And I started looking back at the first inklings of science. And Ptolemy, P-T-E-O-L-E-M-Y, is uh, one of the first pseudoscientists. I wouldn't say he's a true scientist, but he said the Earth is the center of the universe. And who bought it? The Catholic Church bought it. And they bought it so good that if you didn't work with their program, they had an inquisition. It could be death defined to say the Earth was not the center of the universe. And Ptolemy had uh, planets going around and around and back and around and up and down. And uh, just uh, he must have been a really great thinker because he had things going on that what we know now, it couldn't happen. But he had sold this program to the Catholics and the Catholics believed it because they wanted to be the center. I mean, it would feel good to be the center of the universe, wouldn't it? Nah, maybe not. Anyway, um, so then comes along Galileo Galilei. And I think maybe he was our first true scientist. He bought a telescope and he said, oh, I can make these. And he made telescopes for the generals to be able to see uh, what their enemies were doing from a distance so they could maybe win the war. And it didn't sell very well. So what did he do? He turned it upwards and looked at the night sky and he looked at the way things are going around. And he said, oh, the earth is going around the sun. Venus is going around the sun. Mars is going around the sun. So maybe the sun is the center of our solar system. And he tried to sell that program, and what happened? The Catholics got him. And they made him recant the whole thing and write a letter and say, I was probably wrong. And they put him under house arrest for the rest of his life. And then came along um, I, Sir Isaac Newton, and Newton probably had a 200 IQ. He was quite an intellect, and he said that <clears throat> the attraction that people that objects have for one another is uh, gravity, and gravity holds you together in uh, like an orbit, like we're in an orbit around the sun. And our rotation around the sun pushes us out. So the balance of gravity and uh, being pushed out is um, balanced. So we stay in orbit. And it, it, it always interested me about Newton is that he explained it so well and so succinctly and so easily that he just took care of all the naysayers and all the um, problems that the Catholic Church had with being the center of the universe. And he moved them off their dime, moved them off that platform. And then came along uh, Albert and Maleva, uh, Einstein. And I teach a little course, uh, well, it's a year-long course and the book's like that thick. Anyway, um, called Nature of the Soul. And Nature of the Soul has a little quirky uh, ways of thinking about things that explains what is happening in a very interesting and entertaining way. 
and uh, uh, one of the things that it has is a rain cloud of knowable things. Now, the rain cloud of knowable things circumnavigates the world, and you can reach up and you can pull down what knowledge, like what Dylan said, what knowledge is available to human beings. And you realize human beings is a three uh, process word. Jack Canfield was doing a, a seminar, a workshop for my church, and uh, I was helping him carry stuff in, and I looked at his license plate, and it said I, L V, H U, all in caps. And I said, Jack, what is that? What does that mean? And he said, Ah, he had a devotee, and he could explain it. You know, that's uh, chicken soup for everything. Jack and Jack Canfield and uh, uh, Mark Victor Hansen, and they used to come to my church, and they would speak every once in a while or do workshops or whatever, and. Uh, uh, he said, I love Hugh. And, and I said, okay, fine. What's a Hugh? And he said, well, think of Sanskrit. Hugh, H-U, was the name for God in Sanskrit, right? Or the name for the universe or the name for everything that is higher than us. And he said, man, Hugh, man, is the down here stuff, you know, the physical and being is the connection of the two. So we're a triplicity when we think about ourselves. And uh, so I said, okay, Jack, I understand, I've got it. And then um, he brought in his, all of his workshop material. And, and at the end of the workshop, uh, I, ha I have to laugh about it because he has it all singing and and holding up her hands and dancing around and he's playing his guitar and and uh i thought you know here it is i learned something that was so dynamic and so interesting about human beings and here i am spinning around dancing and and having just this great time um in in a workshop you could even call it a play shop and he always interested me and always taught me things whenever we would get together and have a, uh, a discussion. And Mark Victor Hansen was the same way, uh, except Mark is like up here and he's going, and Jack is kind of down here and going up and down. And I learned from these people so much. And um, equals MC squared, get back to uh, Maleva and uh, Albert, changed our thinking and changed our lives. And the true scientists are always going to be changing, always going to be looking out there for the new, the interesting, the unique, the different. And I think I see a whole lot of change agents here. So I'm going to make you, you're going to be crowned, if you will, light bearers. Now, one of my mentors, Bucky Fuller, uh, our Buckminster Fuller, and if you ever read any of his books, um, he makes up his own words for everything, right? If he, did, if he doesn't find a word that he likes uh, for saying something, He'll make up a word. So I made up light bearers, L-I-G-H-T-B-E-A-R-E-R-S. And so we're all willing to become light bearers. And so I looked at the future now of change. And I said, yeah, the world's getting warmer. But we know that the world is a pendulum swing, is it not? We have had times of very, very, very warm where all the ice caps melted, and we've had times of very, very cold where the whole world was an ice cap. So in that pendulum swing, let's get ready for the warmth, and then let's look out for the cold. And we know that there's gonna be change. And I looked at light, being light bears, and I said, we will see darkness. We will see pain. We will see controversy. We will see, we will see it all. And yet, if we are light bearers, if we are carrying and 
and sharing our light, that golden soul light that we are. Somebody was saying, well, it affects 28 feet around us. That's how powerful we are for 28 feet. How far is 28 feet? And let's all be light bearers. And that's what I would wish for you every minute of every hour of every day, to be a light bearer, to so shine your light so brightly that anybody that is not um, amenable or a light bearer or ready to change, ready to grow, ready to learn, ready to be freer, happier, healthier, more honest, more powerful, we just drop away. And we can carry that light that we are to every point of the globe, to every, we were in the um, Panama Canal and to watch the ships rise that, what is it? Nine feet that it has to rise to go over the rocks is a life changer. I mean, you just, you watch the water come in and you know, they, say a high tide floats all boats, but that tide that they pump in there floats that boat up so it can go a little bit further up over the rock. And then our ship floated up and over the rock. And it's a day long journey going through the Panama Canal if you've never been through there. And it's a phenomenal, I mean, they have to run dead slow because they don't want any wake to hit the sides of this uh, largest man-made lake in the, in, in, on the planet. And it is, um, it is a growth hormone, if you will, uh, seeing this happen and being part of this happening. And it doesn't cost much, only a half a million dollars for one ship to go through the Panama Canal. <laughs> More than a nickel. Yeah, in fact, the ship in front of us turned around and went back through and that's only a quarter million dollars. But let me share with you my dream of the future. And that is for us all to be a oneness and to love the golden souls, no matter where we find them. And if you're having a bad day, go out and find somebody who's having a worse day than you are, help them out, and what happens? It happened to me the other day, and oh my goodness, I was just down in the dumps. And there was a, I, I don't, a, a young man, and he asked me a question. And I answered it as best I could, but you could tell it wasn't what he wanted to hear. It wasn't <clears throat> cogent. It wasn't together. It wasn't, you know, that perfect right answer. You know, sometimes somebody will ask you a question, you have that answer, and boy, you say it, and they go, aha! This was not an aha. But he asked me another question, and another question, and we finally got to the point where we had some symbiosis. You know, we had some mutual understanding. And I thought, yeah, that's what it's all about. I was out of my blue funk or whatever it was, and he was learning something and you could tell he was maybe making a little bit of a change, a little bit of a, of a thoughtful journey. And so for you, to have it all is to learn to love everyone and to learn the golden soul that you are can communicate, connect with the golden soul that everyone is. Thank you. <laughs>